everyone. Happy to be here. Apologies, I am maybe a bit jet lagged. I came directly from New York to here. Uh, before I get into the presentation, I want to give you some context and background about who I am and how I got to this journey of BBVA. I was an entrepreneur before BBVA. I had a data visualization company. We raised a couple million bucks, had some very prestigious clients, including the London Olympics, the Super Bowl, the NFL, The Economist, and so on. It's very, very fun building a company from ground up. Our team went from two to four to 16, had a lot of highs and a lot of lows. So how did I go from being an entrepreneur, feeling the, the, feeling the burn, feeling the excitement to joining a global bank? Um, I did not picture myself doing that either. When I realized, and by the way, my company, it's called Infamous, it still exists. Uh, it's doing okay, we have recurring revenues, we have clients, we're just not doing the beautiful hockey stick curve, which we were discussing over lunch, is the, the thing that all startups want to be, right? So I said I need to take my talents elsewhere. I was looking at later stage startups, I was looking at the Googles, the Palantirs of the world, the people who were having impact on, on real lives, and BBVA came to me, so you'll see later in the presentation, but I actually was a finalist in their startup competition a few years ago. One of those weird things about uh, life that you never really expect to happen. One of the, the guys from BBVA is an angel investor, and he invested in a friend of mine's company. We were sitting over dinner. I was talking to him about how I was getting tired. I wanted to move on. And at the end of the conversation, he said, Scarlett, I have the perfect position for you. Come, come work for us. And my first response was, with all due respect, there's no way, there's no way. Banking, you have, a, you, know, you have an idea of what banks are like. And BBVA treated me very well when I was in the competition. I actually really liked the people, but it just didn't seem like the right fit. I didn't picture myself in a big corporation, yet here I am. So that's a little bit of the journey, and hopefully after we go through the presentation, you will see why I'm here and what we're doing and how we're really changing the world of banking. I will ask you if you have questions. I'm gonna be throwing a lot at you about our strategy, about the way that we view things. If you could hold those to the end. And we can go back through the slides if there's a specific thing that you wanna ask about. Um, just to give you an idea of my role in the bank as well. So I'm within the new digital business unit. I was running innovation for North America and now I do business development for all of new digital business assets. So I will walk you through what that means and what, what those are. So just to, to put it in context, because some of you may or may not be familiar with BBVA, we're one of the biggest banks in the world. We have operations in over 30 countries. We're the second biggest bank in Spain. We're the largest bank in Spanish-speaking Latin America. We also have a bank in the US, BBVA Compass, 140,000 employees. My team, the new digital business team, which is the one that, you, if, you, if you are familiar with us, you've probably heard about us the most in the press, 150 people, actually very, very small in comparison. If you include our, our assets and our acquisitions, it's about 500. We have innovation centers all over the world. Each one of those is a little bit unique. We host a lot of external events there. The one in Madrid is my favorite. That's where my whole team sits. It's actually an old palace. We have 200 events there a year. We have universities. We have other organizations. And it's a very, very flat org. So our chief development officer, who is my boss's boss, who reports to our CEO, he sits on that same floor and we have space for startups to work out of as well. So just to give you an idea of, of who we are. Now let's go back for a second. Let's look at a much larger scale. What's going on in the industry? I kind of told you about my experience and what I thought there. It's not gonna be a surprise. We are moving into mobile. We are moving into the digital world. That's why we created the new digital business unit. People are going less and less to branches and more and more through mobile banking. The way that they think about things is different. I'm sure you, many of you have heard of the statistic. If not, you will now. Uh, millennials especially, there's all this talk around millennials. What do millennials want? What do they care about? Millennials would rather go to a dentist and go talk to a banker. Banks' views are not great in millennials and beyond, and they're, you know, they're the future, so we should really think about that differently. Banks, other big corps, we face a lot of obstacles, right? We think about legacy ITs. I talk to many of my peers, and there's technologies and startups that they would love to work with, but they can't because the process would just be too hard. Integrating within their legacy systems is too much of a challenge, it's too expensive. They have other things on their roadmap. 
What do startups do very well? They fail, they take risks, and they fail a lot. Big corporations, by nature, are risk averse, so how do you balance that out? The way that you interact, people want simplicity, they want transparency. You typically don't get that from banks. A lot of banks get a lot of fees from overdraft, you know, things that they don't have the greatest relationship with their customers. And the, sh the cultural shift, the way that you talk to your customers, what that experience looks like is, is very different. So I'm gonna give you, now I'm gonna talk about how we are approaching this. We talked about what we do, we talk about some of the problems, and here's how we're approaching it. It will be a, a short video. I have a little idea that I'd like you to help me get off the ground. People spend so much time on social media and they create a huge amount of data. Now what if we could work a little magic to create an enhanced version of themselves? You're saying you want to use artificial intelligence to make people more popular? Honestly, that sounds incredibly frivolous. You've done a better job than anyone else in your profession at describing the future of the financial industry. We intend to play a key role in that future, but we're still missing a key piece that we need to complete the digital financial puzzle. I was learning everything I've read and shared, searched, or read on screen over the last few years is gonna become a memory frame. But we can't solely depend on human labor to adapt and share this information with 80 million customers 24-7. Who do you trust to manage your savings intelligently? No one. Exactly. You trust your gut. You trust your intuition and your own judgment. No one's ever got more than 30% on the blimmin' Turing test. What if I were to offer you an alter ego to manage your finances? And please, don't, don't take this personally, but he's smarter than you are. It's about answering a question that Turing posed 65 years ago. Memory to 70, emotiveness to 75, sociability to 70, and... Wait, wait, no, no. What? This won't work. What do you mean? The algorithm is based on you, right? That news is that we have reached the limits of our capacity. We need a lot more power. But I need your help. I think it might be a little too soon to present it, but honestly, I don't have much time left. Do you want me to help you set up a fund in Rome? It can replicate our behavior, our activity on the social network. Enhanced me is you, at your best, 24-7. What's so great about a robot that writes messages uh, on Twitter that we should invest $1.5 million? Followers. In less than a week, Enhanced Me has managed to accumulate one and a half million followers. And it's two and a half million dollars if you'd like a 30% share. We have the capacity of analyzing 80 million operations in depth and in real time. The question isn't how, it's when. That's pretty impressive. I, I have built a pretty strong network online and it took me a few years to do that and I'm not anywhere close to that number. So that just gives you an idea of the way that we think. We really, our team, when we think about innovation and you know we're here at the CIO Summit, what does that mean? There are plenty of great things that can change small parts of our business, that can change a small part of our customer experience. My goal is to look for things that's gonna change the future of banking, change the future of the way that we work. So now let's break down into our new digital business unit and what that means. We have about six main areas of focus that we look at. Lending, both for the consumers and small businesses. Payments of all kind, we're a bank after all. Payments have been around forever, but there's still so much that's going on in every country, and the US included. 
wealth management, you saw a little bit of that there. The robo-advisors, that's a big space that's starting to take over and we're looking very deeply at it. I'll get to open platform later. Neobanks, vertical banks, right? The, you, you start saying things, you saw it with credit cards. People were making credit cards for sports teams and credit cards for colleges. You're starting to see the same thing with banks. There's a bank for the millennial, the bank for artists, the bank for entrepreneurs. People want things tailored and customized to them. That's what they're used to, that's what they're accustomed to. Identity, what does that mean? Who owns your identity? Think about the impact that this could have in the future, especially for things like financial inclusion. Someone doesn't have a credit risk or they don't use FICO scores in other parts of the world, so they can't get a loan, they can't get a credit card, but you have a lot of information. You have their teleco bills, you have their electricity bills. How can we use identity in a different way? Insurance, of course, is a, is a big one, and we're looking at that a lot as well. So here's a high-level overview of the areas that we're looking. What we do here, and a lot of other big corps and other big FIs look at these things as well. We do it and we attack it from every sector, and I'll walk into each one of these in a little bit more detail. Internal incubation. We're actually incubating projects, ideally to turn them into startups within this group. We have people, their backgrounds, entrepreneurs from the big fintech players like PayPal, other places like that, a few from the bank itself who have that expertise. We have EIRs, entrepreneurs and residents, you know, successful entrepreneurs who have sold multiple businesses who want to start their next one and they think of BBVA as a value add partner where we work together. We are doing this simultaneously in the US and in Spain. We have three companies right now in the US, one of them with an EIR and three in Spain, one of those is actually in the UK. We're looking at an expat bank, a digital bank for small businesses, and then a, an ID company, which I alluded to a little bit earlier. In, in Spain, we're looking at a lending company, we're looking at you know, FX trading, and an insurance company. Oh, and one thing I should mention here, venture co-creation. We've been doing this process for a while. We go through different phases, we do ideation, and BBVA invests in these companies that we actually, that when they get to a certain point, they have to go and present to a board. We don't call it a board, it's people, executives in BBVA and external people. And then we actually invest in these businesses and the idea is for them to spin out and be independent businesses. And we can also do this with other players. So this doesn't have to be directly an FI. It could be in other areas as well. So if there's something really interesting that's happening in health tech, as an example, and BBVA you know, with our background in financial services and there's payments, there's movements of money, we could be part of that adventure as well. Partnerships, we've all heard about this for a long time. The examples here, these are primarily in the US at BBVA Compass. We were actually the first bank to partner with OnDeck. We ha right now we have a referral relationship with them. We've, we've been talking to them for almost three years. OnDeck's relationship is most well known with JP Morgan Chase and we started uh, that relationship actually before they did. Dwala, real-time movement of money. In many other countries of the world, it's not as big of an issue as it is in the US. We were actually the first bank to partner with them. They have very well-known investors, including Union Square Ventures in New York and Andreessen Horowitz, who if any of you read CB Insights, it's a great source if you don't. They have a daily newsletter that's free. Andreessen is voted by all startups as the best fund in the world for get actually getting money. So we take two approaches here. Uh, here is ones that we do. We actually have a team dedicated to digital uh, M&A. We have the team who does the traditional M&A that goes and buys banks, like BBVA Compass, which we acquired about 10 years ago. And we have teams who are looking at all the digital acquisitions. Simple was our first. They're based out of Portland. They're a digital bank focused primarily on millennials. And their whole thing was all about simplicity, right? Transparency, no fees. Customers are most important. Their brand is really what makes them unique. They have the highest net promoter score in the industry right behind USAA. It's interesting because if you go and read the reviews on the App Store about Simple, their customers love them. Your app, this doesn't work, love you. It could be the exact same problem that BBVA Compass has. You go read that review on the App Store for BBVA Compass, it's not so nice. I hate you, die, so on and so forth. So it's just a very different experience because they, their customers are their priority. They will do anything and everything for their customers. Mediva is a big data company we bought out of Spain. 
Spring Studio is a very interesting uh, acquisition. It's actually a design studio. People get very confused. Why was a bank doing that? If you, go, if you think back to what I was talking about earlier, which is what are customers used to and how, ex how important the customer experience is, Spring Studio is a perfect example of that. There's a lot of internal wars about who gets to utilize these guys because what they do is so incredible. Everything from design thinking to being part of our process. I talked to you about creating startups within the bank. They're a key part of that. They go out and they interview our potential customers. They're part of the entire process about the way that we think about creating the app. Again, back to those same principles about transparency and simplicity. Adam is another great one. They were the first mobile bank out of the UK, so we didn't actually acquire them. We got a 29.5% stake in them. They were the first one that the UK government gave a license to be fully mobile, and they're doing quite well. And then we have Holvi, going back to the neobanks. They're based out of Finland, one of the best fintech companies in Europe and have been for a while. They're focusing on the digital bank for small businesses and, and freelancers. And then we have our venture capital fund. So we had BBVA Ventures before. In February, we actually just spun off. They're now called Propel. And later on, I'm going to be a judge, and one of the companies is named as Propel, so it's going to be interesting. <laughs> but we have uh, had them for a while. It's a $250 million fund. Why do we spin them off? There's a handful of reasons, but one of the things is autonomy. They now don't have to go to a board and get approval to make investments. We're their sole LP at, at right now, but that's the way that it is for the time being. They also can invest earlier stage. Historically, they couldn't get involved until usually Series B, Series C. Now, that it can, now they can invest in stage days companies, and they have. They also have a much larger array of companies they can look at. It doesn't have to always be as directly strategic, anything within financial services, which gives them more flexibility. By the way, this is a competitive advantage for us because we can talk to the companies very early on in the life cycle and continue to provide value add from investing to, to partnering to, to acquiring, and then you'll hear the, the next one that I'm gonna talk about as well. Here's a highlight of some of the investments we've made, and there's a handful more, especially some early stage siege stuff in the last few months. So open platform. You saw it briefly on the slide before, so let's talk about this a little bit. Open platform is pervasive in all of the other things that I just mentioned to you. What does open platform mean? We are trying to be, as Shamir Karkul, who, by the way, was the co-founder of Simple that I showed you earlier, he's since left, and he's now heading up our open platform globally. We're doing this simultaneously in the US and in Spain as well. So what are we doing here? We're competing with ourselves. What does that mean? We are trying to be the one-stop shop for fintech companies to get everything they need to go and create the next bank for whoever or next payment company for that. It'll be utilizing our piping and our back end. Francisco Gonzalez, he's our chairman and CEO. I call him our fearless leader. He's an old school IBM engineer actually, has, was a successful entrepreneur, sold his company. He's a true visionary. In some cases you see issues with innovation stopping at the executive and board level. Not with this guy. He's one of the reasons why I joined. He talked about BBVA being a tech company 10 years ago. A lot of FIs and other big corps are talking about that now. He said that a long time ago, so it's very exciting. And we have spent a lot of money and a lot of time redoing our core processing system, especially in the US. We built it from scratch. I talked about one of the issues being legacy systems. We rebuilt ours from scratch and built the open platform on top of this. Carlos Torres, he's our new CEO. He was head of strategy before that as of about a year and a half ago. And Teppo, he's the, the guy who's in charge of new digital business, the group that I'm in that we're talking about here. So here's some of the comments that they were saying about what, what's, what we're doing and why it's such a big deal. We wanna be an enabler for all FinTech companies where they can come to us, they don't have to deal with, there's a few other, other people who are doing this, but we have it real time and we want them to be able to do everything and be actually favorable for the entrepreneurs. People ask me, by doing this, aren't you competing with yourself? Yes, absolutely. We understand that there is a high potential for cannibalization, but we also understand that if we don't do it, someone else will, and we're working together with these startups. We're not taking their ideas. Some of them come and they're nervous about working with a big FI like us. Oh, you're gonna take our idea. And the, the easiest way to say that is, with all due respect, our reputation is much bigger than yours. And if we do that wrong, wrong one time, the game could be over. So we are, we are very forward thinking and really trying to partner with the best there is out there. We have a sandbox live now 
that any startup can go to and have access to. We have only a few APIs there and a lot more that are not publicly available that we're in the process of productizing. We have a few pretty big key partners, which we can't make public right now, who are actually already utilizing our APIs in the US. So something else that happens through all of this, this came back up. I told you in the beginning, the dirty secret is I actually came out of this a few years ago. Open Talent, this is our startup competition. We've had this competition now for eight years. It used to be only a startup competition, and as of two years ago, we made it a FinTech competition. We have chosen to not take the route of a traditional accelerator, and we get a, a ton of inbound from this, and the goal there is A, market intelligence, B, you know, to put us as a premier brand within the early stage tech and startup community, of course, most specifically FinTech, and then C, to look for opportunities for new uh, partnerships for us. I talked to you about the timeline here as it is in numbers. These are the two years where it's FinTech specific. When I was running innovation, we actually, I, I ran this for the US last year, and it's pretty surprising. We had almost 1,000 FinTech companies. These are early stage startups. In 2015, it was less than 1.5 million in funding from all over the world, and you see this number continuing. By the way, fun fact, Australia, the first year ever applied was last year. Australia is a great market for this as well. You know, CBA, they're always in the same conversation as BBVA as being one of the most forward-thinking banks. So we're looking forward to seeing not only uh, other countries continuing to add to the list in the future, but also the number of companies coming out of Australia to con continue to increase. And as you can see, the number keeps going up. So what does this look like? I referenced market intelligence before. Here's the type of data that we get out of this. We are big data geeks. We, we love data, we love parsing data in every which way. We have a whole team dedicated to it. I showed you a map of our innovation center before. You walk in there and we have big screens projecting of different things of data and it's really, really fascinating. So this is from this year actually. The number, this was the 1,200 applications for 2016. Payments, I told you. Payments have been around forever, but they were still the highest number of startups that applied. You see wealth management, lending, and it goes from there. We could also go and parse this down by different countries and different geographies. So what does that tell us? There's 20 companies who applied out of Chile, and 12 of them are focused on global remittance. Maybe we should change things about the way that we view the strategy in that area. These are the winners from last year. Actually, I'm here. The Open Talent Finals in New York happened yesterday, and I flew here to be with all of you and missed it. That We have two winners now so far for this year. This one is important. I'm going to talk about this one. Why? Because the CEO is Australian. Her name is Leanne Kemp. Leanne Kemp is from Australia, and she's an expert in the diamond business. Her company uses blockchain. Basically, what she wanted to solve was two different things. One is a social impact, and the other one, of course, is about making and saving money. What Leanne has been able to do is verify diamonds in a very unique way. Each diamond is as unique as a fingerprint, in fact, more. There are many hundreds of points on a diamond that make it unique. Through Everledger and Leanne's technology, she has actually found the ability to put that all on the blockchain. So what does this mean? That means you can track where your diamond came from. You, you hear about, oh, I don't want a diamond from no you know, war conflict. How do you actually know that's the case? Now you do. So there's a huge impact on people's lives and where that happens. The second side is there's a huge insure tech play here. What's to say when I'm here in Sydney that I don't go give Annie my diamond, go back to New York and say, I lost my diamond or someone broke in. This diamond will now be trackable. You go and register your diamond, and you'll see this is Scarlett's diamond. Leanne is getting attention from all over the world. For those of you from Australia, she is one of the best representations you can have. Let me tell you, this is a kick butt woman. Uh, has a lot of amazing backers, both corporate and non. She went out of the Barclays Techstars Accelerator and she won with us as well. Some of her development team actually sits in our innovation center in Madrid with us. I can go into all of these if you want or later on if there's questions and you wanna know about any of them further, happy to talk about them. A lot of lending plays here, some other interesting ones as well. This one is focused on financial inclusion. We talked about using data different ways. They're actually using electricity data to be able to tell someone whether or not they can get access to credit and loans. So what have they done out of this? What have the companies who have come out of the program, what success has come out? Collectively, they've raised over $150 million. 
especially after the class that we have this year, that number I'm sure will go up because I've already seen some of the numbers so far and some are very successful. I talked about this one a little bit, Everledger of course. Where is Secure? Secure, we're doing a lot of business with them. So if I go back to a second around the open platform, it's truly a platform, so not all of the information and APIs will be ours, some will be partners. Secure will be a, could and potentially be a key part in that. So with that, that's my contact information. I'll leave it up there for a second if any of you wanna reach out. Twitter is probably the easiest way to get me, but any of the other ones work as well. I will just leave with you one thought. If you think around innovation, it has to, you hear it bottom up, top down, it's, it's really both. But the most exciting thing is being around people who are having an impact on the rest of the world and encouraging each other to think differently, to fail, and to look for the next big things. So with that, I'm Scarlett from BBVA, and we're thinking ahead.